foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change, and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons, and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook, which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous, and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank, and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back to the session two of this conference. Uh, the session is on Kriyam Panikar and Maritime India. 
For this session, as a moderator and commentator, we are pleased to have with us uh, Professor Zoa Telesilvnia from School of Arts and Humanities of University of Lisbon, Portugal. Among the speakers, we have Mr. Asad Latif, former visiting research fellow, ISEAS Singapore, Commodore Abhay Kumar Singh, He's a research fellow, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. Dr. M. B. Prasad, who is the assistant professor from Calicut University. However, Dr. Prasad will not be able to join us due to certain personal uh, reasons. And last speaker is Ms. Athira Anand, research scholar, humanities and social sciences department, IIT Madras. Before I hand over to the moderator, some customary house rules. All the participants are requested to mute themselves when they are not speaking. Questions can be asked during the discussion round. Panelists can ask questions by uh, raise hand option, and the registered participants can ask questions by, live by typing through the chat box. In case any of the speakers are facing connectivity issue, they may switch off the camera and continue on the audio mode. With this, uh, may I now invite the chair, uh, Professor Zua, to conduct the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning from Portugal. Good afternoon in uh, New Delhi. Uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be hosting uh, such a prestigious event uh, um, organized by the Indian Council of World Affairs, particularly on such a um, seminal personality and character as uh, Kavalan Madhava Panika, uh, who's um, career as a nationalist fighter, as a historian, and as a diplomat is well known uh, in India, and I think elsewhere in the world. So uh, it's uh, uh, with great pleasure that I uh, will be hosting uh, this uh, second session, uh, which uh, is, um, sorry, a, a little bit of scroll. Um, which deals uh, with God. Panika Fort and Maritime India. And um, the first uh, speaker will be Mr. Asad Latif, uh, who is a um, former visiting uh, research fellow uh, in uh, ICEAS in Singapore, and uh, um, he in, has ver uh, several books, including Three Sides on the Search of a Triangle, Singapore, America, India Relations, India in the Making of Singapore, and uh, Between Rising Powers, China, Singapore, and India. Uh, Mr. Asad Latif will be uh, uh, presenting uh, a paper uh, entitled Revisiting Panikar's Maritime India, a Southeast Asian View. Mr. Uh, uh, Asad Latif, you are uh, the speaker, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon to everyone there, particularly Ambassador T.C. Raghavan, Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Singapore. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be with you this afternoon. Even though I speak virtually, I feel surrounded physically by the August ambiance of Sakru House, which has produced some of the finest thinking on India's place in the world and the world's place in India through the agency of the Indian Council of World Affairs. My intention today is to revisit the idea of a maritime India present in the writings of Governor Madhava Panikkar from a Southeast Asian point of view, I shall summarize the observations made in my full paper, which fleshes out the assertions that I shall present here. Those observations draw on Panikkar's foundational works, where I'm concerned from, in, in terms of my paper, which include the future of Southeast Asia, India and the Indian Ocean, an influence on, uh, sorry, an essay on the influence of sea power on Indian history, Asia and Western dominance, a survey of the Vasco da Gama epoch of Asian history, a survey of Indian history and geographical factors in Indian history. Essentially, my argument is that Panikkar's concept of maritime India is embedded in two frameworks. The first framework 
is constituted by the indigenous application of oceanic power manifested by the Cholas, uh, which culminated in the expedition, as we know, against the Sri Vijaya kingdom and the temporary occupation of modern Kedah in 1025. The second framework is created by modern India's inheritance of the maritime thinking of colonial Britain, which grew out of the Vasco da Gama epoch in Indian maritime history that began in 1498. The premise of this paper is that India's oceanic orbit, revealed by the Cholas and restored and expanded by the British, does provide a geographical basis for India's rediscovery of itself as a credible maritime power in the Indian Ocean today. That rediscovery is an insistent need, I think, in the face of China's naval assertiveness in the Eastern Indian Ocean and of America's openness to India playing a determining place in the Indo-Pacific maritime region. The paper looks at contemporary Southeast Asia in the refracted light of Panika's historiography. It focuses on the emergence of the Indo-Pacific as the defense area and at the quadrilateral security dialogue or quad consisting of Australia, India, Japan and the United States in the context of an appropriate display of Indian maritime resolve. The paper concludes that India's maritime consciousness and its consequent naval policy should draw on supportive external mechanisms, but, and this is a very important but, but with due regard to India's strategic autonomy. Southeast Asia provides the maritime bridge between India and the wider Indo-Pacific, and that's where I come in. Let me begin with Panika's Southeast Asia today. In the future of Southeast Asia, the book, Panika draws on both early and colonial Indian history to illustrate the lasting Indian impact on further India, consisting of Burma, Thailand, Indochina, Malaysia, sorry, Malaya as it was then, and Indonesia as it has come to be today. Except perhaps for Burma, the entire region lay within the Indian sphere politically from the first century AD to the middle of the 15th century. Drawing a contemporaneous line from those times to 1943, he notes, Panika notes, that, I quote, the stability and military power of British, of, sorry, of Britain in India, end quote, forms the basis of peace in the vast region to India's east. The corollary is that, I quote again, the establishment of a strong, stable and effective central government in India is a problem of vital in international importance, end quote. That was not to be. The partition of India destroyed the strategic unity of the subcontinent as a potential world power at a transitional moment in global history that was marked also by the emergence of the bipolar divide between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. These dual partitions of India and of the world subverted the role that a free India could have played in the creation of a free Southeast Asia during the latter's delicate transition from colonialism to independence, at least somewhat along the lines of the Pacific future that Panika had intended for post-colonial lands to India's east. The end of the Dagama epoch, initiated by the British withdrawal from India in 1947 and the departure of Western navies from China in 1949, would have tremendous repercussions on Southeast Asia, as Panika foretold in Cassandrian outline. The value of Panika's work lies in that it looks beyond Southeast Asia as a colonized sphere of Asian space. A European colonial construction formed of constituent polities such as the Dutch East Indies, the Malay States, French Indochina, and the Philippine Islands and a collection of discrete geographies, such as the Malay Archipelago. He looks at Southeast Asia as a whole in the, in, the, in the process of being formed beyond the colonial period. The Asian influence 
took the form in Southeast Asia, the Asian influence took the form of the Indic and Sinic systems. In the Indic Mandala system, classical India demarcated the power of kings in terms of the circles forming around them. In the Sinic order, an imperial tributary system classified the Nanyang, that is the region lying to the south of China, during the Ming and Qing dynasties. Uh, the Indic kingdoms that emerged in farther India possessed a distinct advantage over tributaries of the Chinese order in that the kingdoms were not tied to an, were not tied to an imperial political center back home, but enjoyed only traditional affinities with Indian dynasties. Dr. Raghavan draws attention to research that shrinks the core of the ancient Hindu colonies thesis by arguing that in interactions between India and Southeast Asia, indigenous, within quotes, agents and drivers, end quote, adopted and adapted Indian ideas to suit their own circumstances. Thus, I quote again, the agency for change and adaptation did not pass out of the societies of Southeast Asia to India, whatever may have been the nature of the links between ancient and medieval India with kingdoms in Southeast Asia, or colonies, the latter were not, the end of Dr. Raghavan's quote. So the Southeast Asian colonies, the so Southeast Asian uh, formations were not colonies. Convincing arguments have been made for treating the Mandala system as one of the sources of contemporary Southeast Asia's regional state system. However, it is true also that a strong and stable China preserved a hierarchical order there peacefully and ensured informal equality, an equilibrium destroyed by the Western intrusion into Asia. That avowedly pacifist China, unfortunately, hardly is in view today, whatever its precursors might have achieved before the advent of the Westphalian system in East Asia. So we are back to Westphalia and then back to Dr. Panikkar. Now what about India in this larger scheme of things? India is an inheritor of the Westphalian system. We have to be clear about that. As an inheritor of the Westphalian system, Panika avoids incorporating India's colonized present into a redemptive long durée in which India, which once ruled so-called colonies itself, remains a life member of a select league of imperial civilizations, such as Greece and Rome, although it has fallen to parvenu British colonialism now. He rejects that view. Instead, he is interested in, in placing India in the Southeast Asian future. It's the word future that matters, the future, the future. At a time when the military contours of India and Southeast Asia were being redrawn by the establishment of the Southeast Asia Command, or SIAC, under Mountbatten in 1943, with its headquarters in New Delhi, moved later to Kandy. Southeast Asia is defined by its location south of China and east of India. With an eye on the region lying within an Asia arising from colonialism, Panika suggests that in the event of a British withdrawal from India to Africa, India would be obliged to join, I quote, one of the other great defense areas, one of the other great defense areas, end quote. Those defense areas being the Soviet Union and a revitalized China in the anticipated event of a defeated Japan. How true he was. Not that India joined any of those, uh, joined a revitalized China, but the defeat of Japan, which was which he saw coming. Now, let me jump a little. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991 ended the Cold War and the global partition to which India had been subjected since independence. Global partition. India's Look East policy, inaugurated in 1991, grasped the strategic significance of that global moment. Admittedly, the breakup of the Soviet Union deprived India of its most trusted international partner for decades. India now had to contemplate its strategic future without the benefit of the Soviet Union playing a countervailing role in an Asian order characterized deeply by relations between the United States and China since their rapprochement of the 1970s. However, New Delhi also was free now from having to calibrate its declared policy of non-alignment with an attendant eye on Moscow's global ambitions. 
which had been more expansive than India's national interests and aspirations required. India's defense area, reminiscent of Panika's delineation of defense areas, then, after the Cold War, moved eastwards inexorably. There, India was reminded of Panika's unblinking view of geography, wherein, it's a very important quote, I begin, the Gulf of Malacca is like the mouth of a crocodile, the peninsula of Malaya being the upper and the jutting end of Sumatra being the lower jaw, end quote. Clearly then, quote again, entry to the Gulf can be controlled by the Nicobars and the narrow end is dominated by the island of Singapore, end quote. This was the geography that formed the politics of his thinking. And I move ahead again now. The Luke East policy of 1991 and the Act East policy of 2014 represented a break with the continental worldview of Indian diplomatic historiography which had been crafted by the North Indian construction of a national history marked by overland invasions, when, in fact, the land invaders had been assimilated, unlike conquerors from the sea, who had assimilated India into their drifting maritime empires. Panika's maritime universe was shaping itself around India again. However, there are differences between his times and these. The critical difference is the institutional ambit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, in the global orientation of the Southeast Asian region. ASEAN is not a supranational organization along the lines of the European Union, which acts on the basis of pooled sovereignty. But ASEAN coheres sufficiently to ask foreign powers to treat Southeast Asia as a cohesive region. Hence, this call for ASEAN centrality. Looking ahead, having said this, however, Southeast Asia cannot avoid the periodic strategic reconfigurations of geography, as evident in the formation of SIAC. The region straddles the bi oceanic geography of the Indo Pacific, a maritime territory that stretches from the eastern coast of Africa to the western coast of America. The scope of India's naval power in the Indian Ocean combined with the degree of American power in the Pacific Ocean, will influence the destiny of Southeast Asia. That destiny depends in part on the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. There is affiliative symmetry between SIAC and the Indo-Pacific in outline. Much as SIAC had been occasioned by Japan's Southeast Asian conquests in the First World War, I'm, I'm so sorry, in the Second World War, um, China has risen now to challenge the United States in the long aftermath of the Cold War, in which both nations were victors, we have to remember, against the Soviet Union. Just as Japan went from being a Western ally in the First World War to an adversary in the Second World War. China is America's new Japan. How should India respond to this latest reconfiguration of Asian military space? through the American renaming of the, of the Asia-Pacific as the Indo-Pacific? In seeking an answer, it would be useful to recall Panikkar's sense of India's relationship with larger defense areas. He had in mind those of Britain, the Soviet Union, and a revitalized China. The first two areas have disappeared, and the third area, that of China, is forming as an entity, as an entity hostile to India's interests. The Indo-Pacific is a microcosmic theater of a larger confrontation between a reigning global power and its primary challenger, the United States, China. SIAC, the SIAC period of India's late colonial history and the emergence of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic opportunity today, both are marked by hegemons, Britain once and America today, stalked by the expense incurred by imperial overstretch amidst national economic decline. Panika in the, in the 1940s could not have foreseen British military retrenchment east of Suez in the 1970s, but that transition has become an, un, an unremarkable part of strategic historiography. The possibility of unexpected but lasting transitions would cast salutary doubt on the durability of any international order premised on the staying power of hegemons, the come and the go. 
The United States is confronting the challenges of preserving its preponderant military power, but incommensurate economic strength in the face of an economic rise which is fueling China's very generous military spending. The Indo-Pacific region draws the countervailing agency of the United States into India's attempt to thwart China's attempt to bring the Indian Ocean into its sphere of influence. Beijing would understand that it deals effectively with Washington when it deals with New Delhi, a relationship that China cannot offset with a comparable tacit alliance with any other major country in Asia. Thus, it would be unwise for India to not insert itself into the unfolding map of an Indo-Pacific in which Chinese revisionism affords India the possibility of partnership with the United States. After all, Anikar was eager to show up an Indo-British status quo in the face of transgressive Japanese imperialism. An Indo-American partnership today could prevent China conceivably, I say conceivably, from joining the doomed trajectory of Imperial Japan. Most Southeast Asian nations would prefer a balance of power that would rescue them from having to choose between America and India. India is crucial to the, to the emergence of that balance of power. This said, Panika might well have adopted an agnostic position with regard to the Quad. True, the Quad in particular and the concept of the Indo-Pacific in general as a single strategic region offers India an opportunity to replicate the Sino-American rapprochement of the 1970s, this time with the United States. In an era when American hegemony was challenged globally by the Soviet Union, America facilitated China's rise as an Asian offshoot of its own power. China is the incumbent Asian power today, challenged by an ascendant India. America refuses to give China peer status, peer status, manifest in its dismissal of the notion of an exclusive G2 in which they would share intramural responsibility for the ultimate management of global affairs. Similarly, China refuses to acknowledge India as a peer Asian power. In both phases of contemporary history, what is apparent is the tension attendant on a rising nation's demand for a new balance of power that would reflect the existing distribution of power and the incumbent's refusal to give it peer status. Epochs of power transition are made for conflict, as is evident in America's straight conflict with China, which is ultimately strategic. However, if China is to be compared with the foreign Soviet Union, Cold War 2.0 might not end as Cold War 1.0 did, with the physical breakup of the countervailing power and the capitulation of international socialism to the global hegemony of neoliberalism. Instead, the possibly unsettled outcome of Cold War 2.0 could draw India into an era of attritional conflict reminiscent of an earlier erosion of the international order. That occurred between the Congress of Vienna, 1814-1815, which remapped Europe after the Napoleonic Wars to reflect the intersecting interests of Austria, Russia, Russia and Great Britain, and the evaporation of that peace just 100, 100 years later in the intra-European conflagration that caused the First World War. Uh, what comes to mind also is the post-Napoleonic concert of Europe, concert of Europe, a great power construction that was turned on its imperious head by the European revolutions of 1830 and 1848 and by the unifications of Italy and Germany. Panika's keen sense of Europe, I mentioned these because Panika's keen sense of European history and its imprint on the rest of the world would have alerted him to the analogical problems of status quo powers today, although they have reason to range themselves against a Napoleonic China and the Bonapartist streak in its foreign policy. Modern day panickers would hope, no doubt, that China would rejoin the global order as a supportive stakeholder, as Japan did after 1945, but this time, of course, without a war. That's the hope. Meanwhile, however, the Quad is both an invitation and a warning to India to consider just how far it is willing to go to chart its path between abandonment by the West and entanglement in its global affairs. 
Our subcontinental power is too large to be ignored in the remaking of the world, but it must remain true also to its geographical destiny by refusing to be held hostage by that remaking. In conclusion, K. M. Panikkar's contribution to the growth of a maritime consciousness in India is receiving belated recognition in an era marked by the naval assertiveness of both status quo and revisionist powers in the newly conceptualized Indo-Pacific strategic region and the informal realignment of four nations that is apparent in the Quad. Viewed from Southeast Asia, India's opportunities are real so long as the country retains its strategic autonomy. I say this because that autonomy form the pivot of Panikkar's optimistic but realistic strategic imagination for India. Panikkar survives in the elegant materialism of his India's maritime place in the world. Thank you. Well, thank, um, um, Dr. Um, Asar Latif for um, keeping his time. And now um, I will give the floor uh, to Commodore um, Abai uh, Kumar Singh um, from the Indian Navy, the retired. Um, he is uh, currently a research fellow at the Military Affairs Center in the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Uh, he um, was an active uh, officer of the Indian Navy and served in various commands and staff appointments during his uh, naval career. He has also served as Director of Military Affairs uh, in the Disarmament and International Security Division of the Ministry of External Affairs. And Command, uh, Commodore Singh is an alumnus of the Naval Academy Defense uh, Services Staff Course and Naval War College. He was, uh, he has um, a master's in philosophy from Mumbai University. Maritime geopolitics and the uh, Indo Pacific is its key area of research. And his paper is entitled uh, The Geopolitician and His Evolving Mental Map A Critical Survey of Kian Panikar's Geopolitical uh, Reflection. Commodore Singh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, and uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, I have a PowerPoint and let me share it first. So, uh, this is uh, my presentation. Essentially, I am looking at all his geopolitical reflections, which has been talked in previous sessions as well. But my approach is a little different. And how it is, uh, let me show. Uh, this paper actually began uh, with a search of a quote. And this is from a book by uh, Professor Holmes uh, Weiner and Yoshihara, Indian Naval Strategy in the 21st Century. And uh, he has cited one quote of Panikkar. He says that if Indian Ocean become once again theater of naval rivalry, India will be no more safe than China was for a hundred years when it was the cockpit of European ambitions. Now, a uh, very interesting quote, and it says that uh, you find it on page 14 of India and Indian Ocean. And here it is, page 14. This quote is not there. I didn't find it. I went to earlier page, previous page. No. Till such time, I looked for the full citation. And full citation says that this is quote from his first edition. What I was looking for. And here is the quote. The first edition, yes, this quote exists on page 14. And the previous para, which is there on page 14 in second edition, is appears on page 15. And that brought me that these two editions of book have some difference. And then I started closely uh, reading both books side by side. And here you will find, actually I realized 
that these two books are essentially they have substantial differences uh, what earlier i highlighted was a uh, quote in the introduction which i found it missing but subsequent reading there are change editorial changes in from chapter 1 to 6 but chapter 7 in the first edition now becomes the with a different title indian ocean after the second world war there is no appendix in the second edition comes with a fresh conclusion book length remains same actually 33 pages are different in 170 116 pages book that's so much of difference essentially primary argument is that in first book he talks about that while only in cooperation with the britain the oceanic defense based on india is possible in the certain chances of today and the second one the key argument is defense of india can no longer be left on the british navy i will come to this comparison separately and this was at the stage when i saw this uh, announcement about the panikkar seminar my original paper was a comparative study or shift in these two books but as i went to read further about the panikkar of uh, my paper enhanced and my understanding of panikkar enhanced i mean of course uh, in first session itself uh, even introduction the dg icw talked about that while he was applauded he was also criticized uh, and uh, some of the criticism related to the shift in his uh, thinking and uh, some people argue that habit of mind which wants to please powers to be uh, even professor rajan in the earlier session said that a quote from the nehru which is from the raja hati singh book window on china that panikkar could be communist in thinking and champion of freedom in washington as so long as he takes it uh, one of the more serious criticism was about that he is being a sinophile or uh, some witty criticism about being a chinese megaphone no more interested in protecting chinese interests or like now uh, what i really found is that while uh, his role in shaping india china relationship had been quite comprehensively dealt by a book by karunakar gupta published in 1974 which closely looked at both side of argument and provided that probably panikkar is not so blame worthy it was and then another issue was about historical methodology that also has been a very uh, comprehensive by tarasankar banerjee a uh, profile of a historian essentially my reading uh, emerges that panikkar is probably a checkered brilliance and this again title is borrowed from jayaram ramesh book on uh, bk krishna menon being misunderstood uh, probably our understanding of panikkar despite his being so popular is not so much and hence this paper my paper is in three parts the first part deals with how his geopolitical ideas and where the influences came from primarily looking for his formative years uh, the next uh, deals with his geopolitical writing in 40s uh, which i consider and people are there referred as the foundational uh, publications uh, i use it as a blueprint and then his publications post 50s and where his view actually geopolitical views begins to change uh i will not belabor much because previous session has actually covered it in a great length uh, uh that how it was there in oxford years uh, but uh, one of the very interesting document which i found about his oxford year is a paper by rita paoloni an indian student in uh, oxford a uh, came palikar idea between nationalism and princely states a uh, extremely comprehensive which highlights the kind of intellectual prodigy he was while he's been in the uh, his college years in oxford a uh, idea of india is complex and nuanced has been highlighted by previous speakers as well uh, and his earlier writing and he wrote plenty essentially of uh, uh, journal articles which are there we know the book of indian nationalism and ideas which was published uh, when he had returned from oxford but while in oxford he has been uh, writing for journals on the issues related to nationalism uh, indian politics education uh, culture and also on geopolitics in in those year itself so what comes out is a very strong views on western historiography and essentially a sense of indian exceptionalism uh, 
uh, fundamentally he thought that western historian glances has sent to uh, see or portray asia uh, in a different light underdeveloped not so much awareness and he has a difficulty with this and he repeatedly comes back uh, comes out with this in his later writing but more importantly that in his uh, writing during this year he saw through the britain's imminent decline uh, britain will no longer be able to hold it other observation he had is that probably uh, people who think uh, that uh, after the war uh, based on wilson and principles uh, or uh, britain will make india independence and he found that idea uh, misguided and he says that at that time uh, the britain was in a situation it needed colony more than any time previously existed and his his argument was uh, that british rule will continue uh, despite uh, the kind of uh, national struggle happening in india he came back and then he was academic activist journalist this is the uh, most discussed known portion of his life uh but little known is that what he went back to uh for his law reading uh back to uh, europe and period of 5 years 1925 to 29 in comparison to the oxford years where he was uh, more of a nationalist a regionalist uh, vision began to emerge in panikar's thinking most about because of his very close association with the intellectuals based in france and particularly from the region what was then known as a uh, further india what we know today as south east asia and uh, essentially uh, during this time he came out with two book which is that malabar portuguese malabar and dutch which we know but essentially he broad thesis began to form about the how the rookie was the sea power role in the colonization of asia and expansion and how crucial was british in the indian empire as a key to hold so these ideas and influences there and we know his career that of course he was serving this and princely states he was mem- uh, secretary of chamber of commerce participated in all round table conferences but all his administrative political responsibility he was very active in the literary and the strategic discourse circuit he is to continue to have uh, his view on the sea power uh brisnalism asia uh southeast asia uh he used to uh, very popular uh, in the discussion he of course what was earlier is the icwa referred to his crucial role in uh, icwa formation and support but what is not very little known is that how his geopolitical writing came into being uh, and because uh, this is where i point out to the role of Olaf Karoy who was the uh, foreign secretary at that time and uh, he headed a group called vice try study group in during the war uh, essentially it was clear to the british official in india and india office in britain as well uh, that independence of india could no longer be withheld uh, uh, it have transfer of power has to happen but what they were worried about that indian uh, strategic leader or national leader they lack their strategic awareness about the kind of security challenges which the india would have to face after british withdrawal uh, uh fundamentally there is a very interesting book which is there uh, of the brobs of the future of the great game uh, goes to this issue in great detail and essentially uh, while they were reflecting they were uh, generating policy discussion papers uh they were also of the view that their articulation of this strategic concern is not going to uh, get any traction in india so they needed a indian strategic voice and uh, they found in panikar a most eloquent articulant of the strategic concerns of india he was then uh, a prime minister of bikaner and foreign minister and uh, he uh, they began to engage uh, point to note here the western study group didn't uh, had any indian members it was all british official uh, panikar was consulted by them he was not part of the group uh, there is one interesting gentleman called guy wint he uh, figures in his uh, biography as well and we will see him uh, a little later uh, he was a uh, british academician at that time based in india but he was with the as a civil servant capacity with the british information service so 
Uh, we know uh, the uh, Professor Latif spoke about this uh, future of Southeast Asia. Uh, what is point to note that this he wrote this manuscript in just about three weeks when he was returning from a Pacific Relation Conference in Mont Tremblant, uh, Quebec, Canada. He took a break in London to uh, write and complete this manuscript, give it to the publisher. Fundamentally, he wanted to avoid the censorship problem with the Indian manuscript has to face when it's sent from Delhi. His thesis was that future of South Asia cannot be divorced from India and um, freedom of the country like Burma Siam or Southeast Asia cannot be uh, has to be linked with India if their freedom has to be guaranteed. Uh, then he was writing this when the Japan was in occupying of the relation when he visioned the kind of re uh, region it will have after the Japan withdrawal. And then he saw that China's, uh, he argued about the China and this, that, that it's, it is going to be a regional power of concern. And uh, he didn't see here as much of in the range, rather he was saying that the China needed to have access and it will create security concern. And a uh, point he said is that China's mere existence as a great military power on the border of Burma would create a grave complications for India's foreign policy. Uh, he argued in the book that probably it will be uh, given his requirement of the access to the sea from the southward, probably Myanmar could be given as a free port uh, uh, for the China to access at that time. Essentially, the theme of the book was the framework for collective security architecture in cooperation with the other great power at that time, Britain and US. And then came his thin book, which is the strategic problem of Indian Ocean defense. Uh, it's just about 13, 14, 14 pages pamphlet published as a book by Kitabistan. Uh, essentially, it is the preliminary thesis of the strategic challenges which Indian Ocean have, which figured later in the more known uh, book, India and Indian Ocean. And he fundamentally began by arguing that World War II has brought Indian Ocean in the vertex of international politics and with the Pacific Ocean becoming scene of naval rivalry. A connection of Indo-Pacific, which previous author refers to, and Indo-Pacific discourse, which will be shaped in tomorrow's session. And he says that Indian Ocean is a vital area for India's concern, but Western Pacific continue to have a strategic salience. <laughs> The theme of the book, he saw the Indian Ocean emerging as an arena of uh, power rivalry or power dynamics, where there will be multiple actor uh, acting potentially in the, uh, which will not be in interest of India. And he saw uh, probably intrusion of powers from Cape of Good Hope, Red Sea, which was a normal uh, route for the European for, uh, powers to come into the Indian Ocean. Most interestingly, he flagged uh, that probably uh, land route access uh, as it was through from Iraq, Baghdad, uh, in, through the Persian Gulf was inside by Germany, probably could be route via Central Asia to for the Russia for the Walmart water access. Similarly, uh, he saw United States uh, having a, now established a great uh, presence in the Western Pacific. It is, and with his interest growing in Indian Ocean, it will be in the Indian Ocean. But more uh, seriously, he flagged that the research in China will make inroad into the Indian Ocean. And his solution was to uh, ring fence Indian Ocean uh, with the combination with the Britain and India for the protection in the Indian Ocean. Now, uh, this book has been uh, much talked about India and Indian Ocean, and this I'm referring to the first edition having pointed the differences between two editions. Uh, it is known that it challenged Eurocentric historiography of the sea power's origin. Uh, essentially, it says that monsoon wind and the sea power application was much before that when the sea power's understanding began in the Mediterranean and the agency. He strongly critiqued the continental fixation of India's defense and uh, fixing on the land boundary from Mughal to British. Uh, of course, one has heard a lot about this in criticism of uh, what kind of exploitation the European colonialism uh, from the sea uh, got to India. 
he was concerned about the sharp tone which he had taken in criticizing british and he was apprehensive that probably uh, it will run foul of the censor uh, but uh, point to note that this book publication was facilitated by olaf koru who wrote to lord emery that despite the criticism this book has a strong salience and many of the ideas in the book has a uh, correlates with what was being produced by the western study group we talk about that he uh, the kind of extensive historical and cultural reach which india has in the indian ocean region uh, indian ocean region now in the definition include even western pacific which was more convergent with the contemporary discourse of that time even nehru in his discovery of india uh, gives a similar narrative historians like rc mazumdar and kalidas nag had covered this kind of connect which india had but what it diverged from was explicit and insistent advocacy of realist geopolitics uh, it talked about that there, there is a uh, geopolitical power struggle imminent and india will have to take some fall very interestingly what people don't often talk about there are three appendices in this book uh, which talks about details uh, the kind of imperial organization which is required for indian ocean uh, defense uh the kind of organization structure uh, would be required for the uh, making the indian ocean regional security architecture and of course it has to be based on the uh, india's connection with the britain he uh, covered the similar idea in a pacific affair article in uh, 1945 in the regional organization for indian ocean defense but he had taken security now more than the Uh, what we understand the sec- military security issues to a broader issue of national security and he says that such a organization also needs to work for human uh, development of human rights fundamental freedom in the region and the economic support for uh, ensuring social security in the newly independent states then comes the next book because he has been harping right from the future uh, of uh, south east asia about Uh, the treaty or a need for alliance between india and uh, britain and he wrote a monograph which is uh, published by icw itself uh, the basis of indo based uh, uh, british treaty and essentially he talks he gives that it will be a framework for cooperation of equal partnership and common interest he also argues that it is an inescapable imperative because britain even after uh, handing over power Uh, in 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 india will continue to have tremendous amount of economic and trade interest and which can only be protected if it remains aligned with india similarly india's industrial and the military power development would require support from britain and he envisages uh, a collective regional security uh, architecture which would be centered on india one of the very interesting idea in this book is about the tribe need for a tripartite treaty by this time it was very clear uh, that probably uh, partition of india it will it was nearly a kind of uh, certainty and he says and he has been in favor of uh, idea of a pakistan right from his book when is the future of in, uh, india and south east asia in 44 he talks about the kind of struggle and divisiveness which has built in indian politics probably it will be wise to consider pakistan as a separate state but what his head vision was that india and pakistan having separated for the political administration would continue to work under a federal structure where the external uh, security and the foreign policy would continue to be coordinated and hence he proposed this one of the very interesting idea he has that he goes on to way who could be partner with india for uh, such a kind of security alliance or uh, say alliance framework he goes on to way uh, us uh, france china russia and uh, among uh, all these he says britain is preferable but he has very interesting take on russia which i have flagged here it is clear that without such an alliance between india and britain india must inevitably fall within the orbit of russia and he says that all that russia he goes on to argue that there is not much 
which uh, Russia would be interested in India to engage with, other than uh, using a Jerem land to access to the uh, sea. And he says that even that doesn't happen, Russia will only be concerned that to see that India doesn't join any other book, uh, group. Means that India remains non aligned, that would be favorable to Russia. Very interesting argument. Then came, uh, since he has been focusing so much about the importance of sea power, which is likely to play uh, in the Indian defense. And uh, rightfully, at that time, some of the reviewer had criticism is that probably he is neglecting or he is uh, probably focusing on sea too much. So he went on to write this essay. Uh, in India Quarterly, uh, published in 1947, where he examines Himalaya's role in Indian defense. And he argues that it's the most effective land barrier. And he says the historian who argued, who has argued that India is a most invaded country are wrong. He says most of the time frontier raids or plundering expedition has been categorized as an invasion. He argued that India is the least invaded country in the world. But however, he says that the protection which Himalaya has offered to the natural barrier has a adverse implication on India's strategic thinking. It led to India's geopolitical in introversion or a manual line thinking mentality where we are not concerned about anybody's outside. If somebody comes to our doorstep to invade, we will deal with it. And he says he probably that has been the problem with the India where uh, majority of when the success of this invasion has happened. And he goes around to analyze the modern weapons implications and argue that still it is a formidable barrier. And even in the current era with the modern weapons, in when he is writing this, that India could be only menaced from the sea. Water. Then is this a short, uh, is a compendium of article again published by ICW on regionalism and security. And while he has been so much of architecture about the regional security, in this uh, book, Regional Security, he takes a completely different thing. Uh, and essentially, he was writing in connection with, it was a seminar probably, uh, with a, a paper presented in a seminar, uh, in relation to the British proposal in San Francisco Treaty for some regional security organization functioning under the ambit of United Nations Security Council. And he differed very strongly with the British proposal and which again he has quoted in the earlier when I said the regional architecture for Indian Ocean. He says that uh, regional security councils functioning under UN is probably not a wise idea. He says uh, that it will just become another instrument for effective assertion of supremacy of great power due to their veto power. So while he preferred regional organization in an architecture, this was a very interesting take where he deferred giving the security organization. And remember this, that he has been talking about regional military organization. But he doesn't want this to be linked with the United Nations Security Council, but primarily for his little apprehension about the great power politics and their veto. And now I come to my last section of my paper, which is the geopolitical context within which he began to change. And there are three factors which essentially uh, could be argued. That one was that Cold War has significantly changed the political geography of Europe and Asia. Uh, with the common, communist in China, with the in PRC, the potential domino effect of spread of from uh, domino spread of communism as we has become real. And in addition, India's strategic geography, in which earlier writing had a natural ancillarity, now had become a little complex. Uh, Pakistan after creation became an unfriendly neighbor with the unnatural boundary in West and East. Tibet was no longer a buffer zone and Chinese challenges uh, was menacingly present in the uh, North. And the most important part was that impending British withdrawal, which signaled a power vacuum in Indian Ocean. And this began with change. Now, I uh, highlight this Colombo plan uh, fundamentally in relation to the his original idea of regionalism in Indian Ocean region. And um, his take uh, further refined that he now he felt that you need a regional organization for preventing spread of communism in Southeast Asia. He writes, and it is important that without immediate and adequate help in the economic field, political structure of the Southeast Asia would provide no more than a frail barrier again to the expansion of communism. And with this, he 
uh, wrote a, a paper for the Colombo plan where the other power will assist in economically to prevent the spread of communism in the region. And he knew that probably the government of India will not be so amenable uh, on this idea. So he went ahead and shared his ideas with the British and Australians and then became the Colombo plan. And now I come to his second edition, which I had earlier uh, referred to. And I said that uh, these two books are distinctly different. Uh, people want, they can go back and check which edition they have and the kind of inferences which they have. Now, there are three key factors in the book uh, which we need to take note of. One was creation of Pakistan. In the previous book, he has described India's sea route from Karachi to Chittagong. Now, with unfriendliness, now it became from Kandla to Calcutta a smaller scope of India's sea boundary and responsibility for protection. He evaluated that the uh, kind of sea power Pakistan could be and challenges would be supposed to be. And um, he was there that why, even though Pakistan has all the material capability to develop into naval power, geographical separation would create a serious strategic concern. He has to have two self-dependent navy on a two widely separated coast surrounded by in center by india and his argument was part partition has not affected india's vital interest in indian ocean in any manner uh, so pakistan could be a minor ir irritant and this is a line which he had for a very long time uh, rather there is one interesting anecdote which he has referred to the secretary to the mountbatten in the interaction okay sir I will conclude. So, uh, this is uh, one issue that uh, partition has not affected. And then was that uh, Britain's withdrawal in India, which he saw that Britain would no longer dominate the Indian Ocean. And Indian Ocean uh, would be now the area of interest of newly independent states. And India would have to play a major role. In this intensification of Cold War, fundamentally related to resurgent China and its likely move. And he says that the Cold War rivalry will bring India to the uh, United States to the Indian Ocean. There is a new prescription, and I, which I already said the defense of India cannot be left. And he says that can India within a measurable time become a naval power? His answer was yes. And he has gone on to evaluate India in Mahanian matrix law in order to say. And he says India needs a long-term policy for a balanced regional level. This is very important quote where he says that Indian Navy is not meant for defense of the coast. And um, a Navy which is rooted to the coastal defense degenerates. Indian Navy, whether it is large or small, must learn in this. And I have underlined this because we will come back soon that how it's changed. I will not discuss because this book has been discussed at a length. And now we come to geographical factor in the Indian history. And I find it a key resource of Panikar geopolitical theory. And he says that our neglect of geography has resulted in that we are neither a maritime or continental in our look. But this is one important issue that his Himalayan defense, Himalaya and Indian defense figures as a chapter, but with significant revision. And he says the Himalaya is no longer a impenetrable barrier because when uh, there are determined enemy, uh, he says that in fact, the Chinese were unable to, in the past, to organize such a strong military area, and, but should not blind us from such a possibility in future. And again, now it's a moderation of a sea power approach where he says that today what we require both a continental view and appreciation of sea power. And now I come to his final book, which is uh, most interesting and most different. A context was again uh, that new area of sensitivity, which has referred to, and he said, even with the two difficult neighbor, India has material capability. That's not important. But fundamentally, what he says about China, he says that border standoff, which has begun to happen at that time, he says that provided a new strategic awareness. And he says, and within court, it has helped India to develop a mind of frontier complex, which was absent in the earlier time. But more, even more important, says, despite whatever is happening, a threat of serious invasion on Indian territory or a penetration or Indian flame from across the high Himalaya is no more than Shimara. He's writing in 1960. 62 proved them wrong on this. And then there is significant change in his sea power requirement. He says that he still argues that sea power is, uh, seaward threat is far more dangerous 
but he realizes that continual, continual, uh, continental threats now require more immediate attention. He says that, and he has a far moderated view on India's sea power. He says that we don't need a navy aimed against a great power. We need a navy in relation to what are the navies in the region. And as it is, he says, even at that time, 60, he talks about that we have a navy which is uh, rather sufficient. Uh, it's okay, one or two aircraft carrier if we get, we can able to manage it. He says that if we are able to manage uh, danger of the powers near her coastline, our immediate role is so. And he says that Indian Navy's role no longer is expansive as it has to go out or defend our coast, protect trade and maintain sea line of communication. But more important issue is remarkable volta face on alliance. He has been talking about alliance right from his first writing. And now he says that decision of India to remain outside alliance in a grouping and to develop her own defensive strength has not only been wise, but is only suited to her condition. In remarkable difference of all argument here, now he talks about the unequal security uh, alliances has been a causative factor to the colonial expansion of the Britain in India. And the quote is there that it was only through the supported an alliance that India lost her independence. He further goes on to argue that unequal uh, alliances brings political influence, military aid, and it is harmful to democracy and makes weaker power partner to the subject. And this is my last slide which says that while we are discovering panic power, uh, we need to be uh, seeing the whole, like critics and his uh, proponent, both has been uh, seeing him selectively. Uh, we are not uh, taking a very wholesome view with the context in which we have written, which is the mission of the uh, critic, and even the people who focus that he has been at core of the sea power development has not noted the changes which brought in in the chain, uh, in the different context in his time itself. And we need to note these two things about when we uh, consider Panikar geopolitical theory. Uh, that first, there is no perfect geopolitician, uh, someone who can uh, leave his ideas and interest aside, you know, assess a geopolitical situation very objectively. And another issue is geopolitical changes are extremely difficult to cause when they are happening and becomes clear only when they have. So some of the criticism is that probably when he wrote, it was just emerging. We know we are judging him in hindsight. And regarding China, we uh, while we have been critic, we must have to keep this quote by Hendrickson that no single mind can encompass all that is humanly possible known to the global environment. Individual person have blind spots and sometimes astonishing one. Thank you very much, Chair, for being patient with me. Thank you so much, um, Kamadol Singh, for your um, interesting and challenging um, presentation. Now it would be the uh, time for Dr. Prasad to uh, present his paper, but as has been said earlier, uh, he will not attend, and then we will uh, go to the next and last speaker of this session, Ms. Atira Hanan, uh, who is a research scholar at Humanities and Social Sciences uh, Department uh, in Madras. Um, there's Chennai, of course. The um, current area of research is in Indochina historical maritime relations. Uh, he, she was uh, an exchange student at the Shanghai International Studies University in China in uh, 2018. She completed a master's in political science from the University of Calicut, Kerala, and she has published a chapter titled Disaster Preparedness and Resilience, Providing Scientific and Technical Safety to Vietnam. Uh, in a book entitled uh, Emerging Horizons in uh, India-Vietnam Relations, published in uh, 2018. Her areas of interest are uh, maritime diplomacy, power in international relations, and Indo-China relations. And without further ado, I give the floor to her to um, tell us about her paper, which is entitled Kiem Panikar's Portrayal of Nalavar, as a strategic location at Indian Ocean during Portuguese and uh, Dutch intervention. 
the floor is yours. Thank you, Jay. My paper, I'm very much in the honor to be part of this session on K.M. Panikar and Maritime India. And my paper is titled as K.M. Panikar's Portrayal of Malabar as a Strategic Location at Indian Ocean, especially during Portuguese and Dutch intervention. Let me share my PPT. Is it visible? Uh, no, not yet. Please try again once. Yeah, now it's going to be pounds. Yeah, now, now we can see. Kane Panikar was born in Kerala and he was an academician, diplomat, writer and a historian. In my paper, I would like to focus on his role as an academician and historian. He was interested in studying about Malabar, uh, who was born in Kerala too. And uh, his two important works which I deal with in this paper is Malabar and Portuguese and Malabar and Dutch. Especially his contribution to the history of Malabar is rich, especially during the period of Portuguese and Dutch intervention in Malabar, which was between mid 15th century to 18th century. Kim uh, Panikar brought on Portuguese and Dutch encounters, the books which mentioned earlier. This book was based on his um, research travels to Portugal, Holland, England, and his study was based on materials collected from various libraries and archives in London, India, Portugal, and paid for his study. And he also used unpublished Malayalam sources, which, uh, and knowing about the regional language was beneficial to Panikar, uh, to do his more on his research. Before moving on to Portuguese and Dutch intervention, I would like to look into characteristic features of Malabar that Panikar portrayed that had attracted Portuguese and Dutch towards. By seeing the map, you can see that the location of Malabar here. The term Malabar, which I use in this paper, is different from the current Malabar, which is divided into Kuching Malabar uh, and Triangle region. At that period of time, it was divided into uh, petty kingdoms. And according to Panika, territorial Kerala, tra sorry, according to Panika, traditional Kerala, which was ranging from Boganam to Cape and characteristic features that he identified, which I categorized into the geographical location, trade settlements, and ascendancy of Calicut Kingdom. Geographical location. Kem Panika gave importance to the factor of geography while considering the history of a nation. Panikar identified the location of Malabar at southern coastal part of Indian subcontinent, which was jutting into the Indian Ocean, as seen in this map, which uh, was an important factor, which attracting the seafarers at that particular period of time. And knowledge about Indian Ocean is essential to venture into Malabar. Next, the trade settlements. There were Jewish, Christian, and Muslim settlements uh, when at mid 15th century. It's, this was a situation at the arrival of Portuguese 
in this post in which the Muslim merchants have high hand over other communities. The characteristic features of Muslim merchants, which was described by Panikar, which includes uh, they are confined to the coastal regions, coastal towns. They are having their establishments mainly at Calicut and Kananu, which are the petty kingdoms at that time. And they have the trade monopoly in pepper and spices. And another important factor is that these Muslim traders maintained a close relationship with Samarans of Calicut, who had the ascendancy over other petty kingdoms. Uh, and one of the factor for the dominance of Calicut Kingdom was their mutual relationship with Muslim traders. And at the time of arrival of Portuguese, um, the Calicut Kingdom already had a rivalry between Cochin Kingdom, which they used as uh, a factor uh, for their intervention in Malabar region. As the region was divided into different feudal kingdoms, access to the markets of these petty kingdoms was important for overseas traders. At the time of arrival of um, Portuguese, Muslim traders have already established trade relations with Tlamavins of Calicut, and they have the monopoly of trade in spices and pepper. Next, we move on to the Portuguese interventions. Panikar quickly approaches the glorification of Vasco da Gama, Vasco da Gama's arrival into Kerala coast. He says that he was merely an agent of traditional maritime policy of Portuguese at that time, which followed the maritime policy of Don Henry. And another factor which attracted the Portuguese was the pepper as the main commodity of exchange, which Panikar observed that the trade which the Romans carried on with Kerala was practically in the same commodities as those in which Portuguese traded at a later time. At this period of time, pepper was the main commodity of exchange. And uh, Portuguese have treaties with the chiefs and rajas of Malabar at that time. And they started construction of factories and forts. Panikar identified two factors as the cause of decline of Portuguese power in Malabar, which was resistance from the Samarins and Avis, and also the corruption within administration of Portuguese. And this led to the decline of Portuguese expansion in Malabar. And then came the arrival of Dutch. And Panikar uh, put forward these factors which are beneficial to the Dutch, which was already established by Portuguese intervention, which were the Dutch claimed all the rights enjoyed by the Portuguese in Cochin. They took over Portuguese system and administered it efficiently. And the Canarians or companies who served Portuguese equally served for the Dutch. And also, Dutch maintained the rights of overlordship over the Cochin Raja. We have seen that Calicut has already having a dominance, and Muslims have, Muslim traders have a good relationship with uh, Calicut. So, the only option for Dutch were to have a treaty with the Cochin Rajas. This also pepper. A Dutch made treaty with petty kingdoms of Kainbulam, Urakkar, Maratudo for securing trade of pepper. These were the uh, petty kingdoms at that time. And another commodity was cotton rope from South Travancore, Cardamom, Indigo. Um, In the midst of this Dutch intervention, Panika notes the uh, factors or new political developments in the midst of this Dutch intervention, which were rise of Travancore, uh, Travancore Kingdom, and the decline of Naya. Um, Naya community was the uh, 
defense section of that particular period but and the decline of this uh, basically led to the decline of power of the petty kingdoms at that period of time in the midst of this political developments panikar identifies these factors as decline of dutch the loss of possessions to charco reduction in power trade due to war with charco and decline of power of minor chieftains of malabar i conclude this presentation by briefing what i have gathered from reading k panikar a tendency for political control over the hinterland can be observed from both portuguese and dutch forces geographical location of malabar and presence of precious commodities like mainly pepper attracted maritime actors towards malabar portuguese and dutch utilized the princely kingdoms in malabar for maintaining their maritime trade base dutch period is marked with increase in maritime actors at indian ocean and rise of travancore in malabar they maintained but they maintained a neutral base towards dominant powers to maintain trade 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 ties with malabar overall malabar was a perfect strategic location for portuguese and dutch for trade and maritime control but the internal political conditions stopped them from fulfilling their ambitions thank you I thank Miss um, Atina Anand for uh, the presentation. Um, more than uh, in time, and um, I'm afraid that uh, it's now my turn uh, to say uh, a few words. Um, first of all, I would like to thank again uh, uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs for um, inviting me, particularly uh, Dr. Dr. Pragya Pandey, um, who has so kindly put up with me for the past months, uh, exchanging uh, emails and trying to uh, get me uh, to this uh, conference. The second is that I um, feel somewhat vindicated for what uh, I've heard in this session, because I always said uh, in Portugal that uh, Panikar uh, it must be uh, studied um, to understand uh, India's role in the Indian Ocean and particularly uh, what India wants to be uh, politically uh, uh, in um, Asia and in the Indian Ocean too. Um, That said, I will start with something uh, that may uh, be a shock, is that uh, Panikar is uh, not that well known in Portugal, and that no none of his books was ever translated into Portuguese in Portugal, but only his uh, magnum opus, uh, Asia and Western Dominance, was translated into uh, in Brazil uh, in uh, 1963, I think, uh, which uh, reveals uh, some something uh, quite embarrassing for the, uh, for Portugal, this lack of knowledge of uh, Panikar and Panikar no, uh, work. Well, I would like to uh, begin by saying that um, Whereas his uh, geopolitical uh, thought is um, still uh, valuable today, his historical uh, perspective is uh, somewhat uh, out of date. Uh, starting with his uh, greatest and uh, most uh, uh, known work, Asia and Western Dominance, where he coined the phrase the epoch of Vasco da Gama uh, in Asian history. By 1975, such a section was already outdated when a new one was coined that was the age of partnership. And therefore, uh, historically, uh, 
that sense of uh, Western dominance uh, since 1974 has been somewhat um, reviewed. And um, what is understood today as a age of Western dominance is a very short period from the 19th century uh, until uh, 1941. Um, regarding the, uh, Asia and uh, the Indian Ocean. And uh, that is perhaps one of uh, the uh, leading problems regarding uh, um, uh, Panikkar's historical uh, works. As uh, Commodore um, Singh said in his uh, paper, we must take into account that um, geopolitical actors see, interpret, and act on their political and strategic surroundings, but they understand the world as an imagined and perceived reality, which may not be what the world really is. Uh, and that uh, is somewhat the problem of uh, uh, Panikar, the historian, but not Panikar, the geostrategist. Um, because uh, I will speak as an historian, uh, Panikar thinks the role of India uh, in the, uh, the Indian Ocean and in maritime Asia from the perspective of the land towards the sea. Uh, particularly uh, since he wants that the newly independent country uh, to be as a kind of heir of the British and of their strategic and naval mindset developed in the late Victorian and uh, early uh, Edwardian era. Whereas uh, the Portuguese and indeed all other European powers until the beginning of the 19th century think mainly uh, the Indian Ocean uh, and Asia from the, uh, 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 a sea perspective, that is, from the sea to the land. And uh, if you have in mind uh, the title of uh, two of uh, the works of a great uh, British historian, Charles Boxer, um, he quotes, uh, which are entitled The Portuguese Seaborne Empire and the Dutch Seaborne Empire, he stresses that same idea that the Europeans have a perspective of the sea towards the land, not of the land towards the sea, which was uh, only developed when they uh, began to uh, uh, dominate uh, parts of Asia. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like... Uh, uh, to point that um, Panikar is quite uh, right when he points to uh, um, the importance that uh, the sea has in um, India's heritage, historical heritage. And uh, not only the, the importance and the weight that the sea carries in India and in uh, history, uh, which can see, which can be also perceived in the work of another of his contemporaries, uh, a historian called Kie uh, Nilakanta Shastri, whose uh, work on um, the um, east coast of India, particularly Tamil Nadu, uh, or, and on the Chola, may have been uh, important on the uh, development of uh, uh, Panikkar's own uh, mindset. But I would like uh, to uh, point out that um, despite the Chola's uh, much uh, talked uh, telesocracy, um, particularly from the time of Raja Raja I, and Sandra Rajendra, uh, I would like to ask uh, 
Mr. Uh, Assad Latif, um, if uh, instead of that political uh, and maritime power, um, in fact, India had more of a soft power uh, since uh, her influence in Southeast Asia for uh, more than uh, a thousand years, starting uh, with uh, the fifth century AD, um, was mainly uh, cultural uh, and not uh, political. Cultural and religious, of course. Uh, secondly, um, uh, still keeping in mind that idea that uh, uh, the Europeans and the Portuguese see uh, Asia from the sea perspective and not from the land perspective, it's interesting to see that uh, um, they developed uh, uh, um, an interesting uh, viewpoint that uh, if they want to build an empire, uh, which is a trade empire and not a land empire, they must go uh, for the straits. And you have since uh, 50, uh, 1510, the Portuguese start to, to, to develop that policy uh, of controlling the straits, uh, the strait uh, that leads uh, to the Red Sea, the strait that leads to the Persian Gulf, the strait that leads uh, from the Bay of Bengal to the South China Sea. So uh, you have, from 1510 onwards, a policy developed by uh, Alfonso Kirk that uh, seeks to uh, conquer those uh, port cities that are at that uh, choke points, uh, which are Aden, Ormuz, and Malacca. And if you see uh, the uh, those who follow the Portuguese, um, the Dutch, the English, they always try to go for the straits. And uh, the straits still are today, uh, the control of the straits are still today one of the most uh, important uh, points that um, uh, the Americans want to keep, China uh, want to have, uh, and uh, India uh, are trying to still see, uh, as in uh, Commodore Singh's map, uh, the threats that uh, uh, India perceives coming from those straits, uh, the, the Strait of Hormuz and uh, uh, Bab al-Mandab, uh, the strait uh, near Aden. Then, uh, still thinking uh, on uh, the idea uh, of Panikar as someone um, who uh, has a, a somewhat British mindset in geostrategic uh, 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 matters. Um, and uh, 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 and he wants to uh, try to update and to modernize that mindset from uh, 1945 onwards. And the question that I ask uh, both uh, Mr. Assad Latif and Commodore uh, Singh is that, um, is it uh, our uh, uh, understanding that uh, uh, Panikar was uh, the uh, pragmati a pragmatist who always was always trying to um, adapt uh, his uh, mindset, his concepts of uh, geopolitics uh, to uh, the reality of the moment, or was he? Uh, uh, a person that uh, had uh, uh, a fixed idea uh, from uh, uh, early on. Uh, and uh, it's um, interesting to see uh, 
for instance, uh, taking into account uh, what uh, Mr. Assad Latif says uh, in the beginning, uh, that uh, he is the heir of the British thinking uh, in geostrategic times, and he quotes uh, Lord Curzon. And once again, uh, uh, Curzon's thought in, in 1909 was mainly uh, looking not to the sea, but to Central Asia. And uh, my question uh, is, uh, why Curzon, when uh, uh, the British were thinking uh, of the sea at, at this time, mainly uh, on the works and the thought of John Knox uh, Lawton and uh, Julian Corbett, uh, whose uh, work, uh, some principles of maritime uh, strategy, had been... Uh, published more or less by the time Curzon uh, wrote what he wrote. And besides that, uh, the work of the American naval officer, uh, Alfred Thayer Mayan, uh, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, um, should have been perhaps more uh, suitable uh, for uh, um, Panikar himself. Then I ask, um, did he knew uh, this, uh, uh, these British uh, uh, thinkers on maritime power and strategy, uh, as well, of course, as the work of uh, Alfred Mackinder, uh, published in 1904, uh, The Geographical Print of History? and his uh, celebrated Artland theory, um, which again may be uh, interesting uh, to see uh, how it can be applied to a, to a country uh, like India, which is not at the Artland uh, of Asia proper. And of course, uh, uh, Mackinder has uh, um, in the Eurasian context, more uh, Eastern and Western Europe in mind than the rest of the continent. But I would like to uh, take that uh, uh, idea, I, I, I won't be uh, for much more time, uh, that idea uh, of the, the, what the British were thinking at this time, and um, uh, the stimulus that may have been received from uh, early experiences, namely the thought that may they, uh, the British, may have been in decline by the late 19th century, and um, which can be perceived in the work of a British historian who worked in India called Frederick Charles Danvers, who uh, in uh, 1890 uh, came to Portugal uh, to uh, study, and uh, he later published uh, a two-volume book uh, entitled uh, uh, The Portuguese uh, in Asia, or in India, sorry, uh, where he sees uh, Portugal's uh, fate uh, in Asia and in India as a cautionary tale for the British. And therefore, he, uh, he points uh, that uh, uh, the British must be more, uh, uh, more on the side of uh, Alphonse d'Albuquerque and his strategy than uh, uh, anything else. And um, only uh, uh, to uh, end, um, I, I would like uh, 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 to point out that uh, Panikar is a man of his time, everyone is. And his time is that of uh, nationalism. Uh, it's, he was not alone. India was not alone. Um, and uh, Israel itself, uh, as it developed in the 19th century, was deeply uh, influenced by what uh, in Europe uh, was 
the rise of nationalism and of the uh, no, uh, notion of the nation state. Uh, but of course, uh, nationalism can be uh, biased, uh, is biased by nature, and can have a, 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 a terrible uh, outcome in a, a historical analysis. Uh, it is true that, as I have said, uh, India uh, has a, 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 an enormous uh, print in the Indian Ocean uh, for a very long time, but that print is more peaceful and in uh, trade terms than in uh, purely naval uh, and uh, power terms. And its uh, soft power, it's more important than its art power on the long run. Uh, though Panikka was completely right when uh, he saw the Indian Ocean as being closely linked with the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific, uh, that was the reality of his time and of the war that was going on uh, after 1941. Uh, but it was not, uh, historically, that was not always the case. Um, because uh, this historically, the Atlantic dimension of the Indian Ocean begins uh, only uh, to be uh, present after 1498, but its specific dimension only begins very slowly after 1570 and only develops fully uh, in the 19th century. Uh, therefore, I uh, would like to ask uh, the three uh, presenters uh, how much uh, of uh, Panikar's uh, analysis uh, in historical uh, events, uh, uh, it's not uh, clouded by the present uh, without him uh, looking uh, to the past and trying to understand the past uh, at, uh, um, as it was then, not as it was in the time he was writing. writing sorry. Um, Finally, uh, I would like uh, to uh, uh, stress that uh, mm -hmm. though politically uh, and in terms of political science and geostrategy, um, Panikar is still uh, 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 an author that one must look at uh, historically, his uh, work has been uh, completely uh, outdated and has uh, um, fell out of fashion. And uh, uh, I would like to say uh, uh, only uh, two or three points, and then I, I will um, open the floor for discussion, uh, is that... Uh, he speaks uh, of Malabar um, and of in its trad uh, maritime tradition, uh, but forgets that uh, Malabar thrived uh, through the ages for being an open and cosmopolite uh, uh, commercial uh, trading center. And uh, since uh, um, the development of international trade in the Indian, in the Indian Ocean, uh, comprising Malabar, from the early uh, centuries of, of the Christian era, uh, you see the settlement of uh, foreign communities, and uh, they became part of of, uh, of, uh, of Malabar. Uh, by uh, a form of integration and uh, tolerance that uh, was uh, quite common uh, in other parts of the Indian Ocean world. 
But uh, uh, Malabar uh, uh, was only a part of a more complex trading uh, world in the Indian Ocean that comprised other regions of India. And to me, uh, that I ask to Miss Anand, uh, is perhaps um, uh, Panika's uh, weakness in that it doesn't it doesn't see uh, um, the importance that other regions in India have in uh, our uh, maritime history, namely uh, Gujarat, uh, namely uh, uh, the eastern coast of India, uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, and even uh, Bengal, uh, not to speak, of course, uh, of uh, regions that are no longer India proper, uh, but uh, were until uh, 1947, uh, namely Sindh. And uh, two things uh, that I would like um, to say was that uh, Malabar is, in fact, a maritime country because it's, com it's a plain comprised between the Arabian Sea and the uh, Western Ghats. Uh, and uh, the frontier for the Portuguese... God, I'm speaking too much. The frontier for the Portuguese was situated to the north of Cananor in a place called uh, Mount of Valley. And um, the Portuguese looked at Malabar uh, on an overall perspective. And when you say they uh, uh, left for Goa uh, because they didn't manage to obtain what they wanted uh, in Malabar, it, it's not like that. That is a vision of Panica. They left for Goa because it had a better port and it was situated in the middle of India, in the India's uh, west coast. And it was closer to uh, Gujarat, which was the art, the pumping art of the Indian maritime world at that time. And so it was for them more important to be close to that uh, maritime and trading art than uh, closer to uh, uh, than to be uh, in Malabar. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank again for uh, the uh, um, invitation to be uh, in this uh, conference and to thank all the three participants for their wonderful papers and who were um, very interesting and I am hoping that everyone has uh, as much questions and comments as I have for uh, the three uh, presenters. The floor is open for discussion. Uh, have we anyone? Yes, uh, I can hear you. We can hear you, sir. So, Commander Robert, there are certain questions in the chat box for you. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, Chair, for a very uh, detailed uh, critical uh, remarks and very interesting observations. Um, I will first address some of the issues which was raised by the Chair, and these are very important. And uh, first one he asked that was Panikar a pragmatist or he, he had a fixed idea. Actually, this is the question on which I reflected a lot. And primarily it draws from a very uh, critical observation on him. Again, I quote Raja Hutti Singh's book on window on China. And he says Panikar is an intellectual hedge, hedgehog with every... Uh, with his every tentacle quivering with ideas. Uh, now, uh, this hedgehog uh, term to the uh, Panikar was very interesting because 
exactly at this time, Isaiah Berlin has published his seminal piece, Hedgehog and Fox. What uh, Raja Hathi Singh doesn't elaborate that what Hedgehog he implies that Hedgehog Isaiah Berlin says they have a fixated idea. Uh, they uh, they continue to uh, fixed upon idea when things have changed. Uh, whether uh, these kind of uh, motives or it was just a uh, one of those sarcastic remarks which you make. So, uh, seeing through the prism of this was uh, Philip Tedlock has a very interesting book on the strategic predictions uh, of uh, people where he evaluates uh, uh, thinkers in terms of whether they are hedgehog or fox. And it's a bit detailed theory, uh, theoretical framework. Now, when I use that frame, Panikkar sounds like a hedgehog because uh, he, whenever he says things are not tentative, it is firm and final. There is no tentativeness in any, any of his argument, in, in any of the uh, analytical observations which he derives on basis of his arguments, all are final. There is nothing tentative into this. He doesn't find any escape route. Similarly, uh, the, so he sounds like a hedgehog. But as I have traced his evolution and the context within his, he's, he has been a fox. He's been adjusting himself. But again, difficulty with the panikar is he doesn't explain himself that why he has changed his view. The two editions of the book, uh, there are multiple authors in a long-running series. Uh, they come out with a new edition. They write a detailed preface that what has changed from the time. To me, he doesn't write any preface when the book has changed 33%. So he doesn't ever explain to uh, his audience that what has been the previous argument, wherein he continues to thread where he has proved himself right in one to another. Uh, there is a very interesting observation of Guy Pocker, who wrote the very detailed review of his book, Asia and Western Do Dominance, called Panikarism, Highest State of Opportunism. And he says that Panikar, when he writes with such a regularity, but each of a book, he doesn't carve like a statue. He, a, he carves like a stepping stone for the next one. And that's why there is a continuity he's in thought. But shift he doesn't explain. Uh, to short answer to this question after saying this, yes, he was pragmatic in his approach. He adjusts his view based on when the context had changed within his time. However, a long theoretical thread of his basic argument, uh, while you have gone at a length to explain that uh, he was giving a theory seeing land, uh, see, land power gauging seawards where the other power has been seen see from the land. But in each stage of evolution of the land power, when it begins, it first begins to see uh, from the land, begin to see the what kind of opportunity or challenges it will have to the sea. Once having been to the sea, start thinking. And it has happened with the Britain. Uh, you said European power, Britain, and same uh, ultimate example, the United States sea power. So that is one. Uh, second question, you says that uh, why Karjan was thinking in terms of frontiers, uh, uh, wherein or whether he was more uh, in, uh, interested or impressed by the ideas of Julian Corbett uh, than the Sipar theorist like Mahan. Very interesting question, but question lies uh, Karjan approach to the land frontier because you gauge where your strategic challenges lies. He was living in an era at that time when there was a assurance of the sea, and Britannia rules the wave, there was no challenger at sea. His only challenger was on the land. And hence, it is uh, thinking about the frontier. Uh, come back to the same, uh, in, uh, just to reflect back in current circumstances. In post-Cold War era, United States Navy's approach has been the similar assurance of the sea, which allows only to power projection on the land. Now, with the another peer competitor growing, the United States has come to review his thesis that its assurance of the sea control or assurance of the sea as it has no longer exists. So uh, Karjan was thinking in a frontier fundamentally because there was no challenger uh, sea power available. 
so they had assurance to, of uh, that challenge the challenges lie on the land which he has to think very carefully uh, now uh, you, you also raise a point about that uh, how uh, closely uh, panikar related to makinda or was he related to mahan actually he was a very strongest critic of makinda and his book uh, geographical factor of india essentially is the first place which goes on explaining his geopolitical theory and there is a very uh, long uh, strong critique of makinder and uh, the kind of ecolites is generated in nazi germany and uh, that's about the geopolitics how it's got a bad name uh, essentially again uh, coming to the question why how he was viewing it viewing in theoretical prism is that he borrowed or rather influenced extensively by the work of speakman who between the heartland and the sea power where rimland had no agencies speakman gave agency to the rim because their approach either to the heartland or to the sea power could be a defining element in the geopolitics and panikar was thinking india in terms of a critical rimland which needs to expand into sea to become a sea power and that's the approach he had uh now how much of panikar analysis was about projecting past into the future uh, i think he was using past only as a point of reference in order to strengthen his hypothesis his uh, geopolitical argument was rooted in the reality of his time his time again quote and quote now uh, the question which i have uh, on my chat box it says that by late 50 commonwealth just didn't have the industrial muscle to the panikar plan could it be that decided to cut his uh, coat according to his cloth so both he and krishna menon uh, nehru was anti american uh, replacing with the british who was uh, uk with the us was not a not appropriate so okay uh, panikar commonwealth didn't have the muscle uh, as per his plan panikar has viewed the very critically the potential of united kingdom and he was remained optimistic that probably even after the vacation uh, they would be able to uh, maintain a kind of economic relationship with their erstwhile colony and in a collaborative approach this could function united his view on united states uh, was a little uh, nuanced at one point he argues that probably in association with britain and us uh, regional security architecture could uh, function but multiple times he views us presence as a uh, not conducive to india's interest strategic interest he considered united states as a interloper in asia uh, as a multiple but again i am just saying that he he, uh, he was very very nuanced and uh, fundamentally while the earlier part when i said that in his view on uh, communism or containing communism found a alliance but he was more worried about the kind of security alliance structure which uh, united states was imposing on the region and there was a little dissatisfaction uh, to panikar about that so i will stop here and um, thank you i will uh, if there are another, any other question may i come uh, in now please may i come in now yes yes oh, okay. go ahead yes uh, indeed um, i think the chair made four points uh, overlapping points for uh, both the uh, the uh, the uh, the commodore and myself and i think one for the lady uh, there are two points that i shall take together one is about um, india soft power in southeast asia soft power being both um, cultural and religious of course indeed so indeed so chair because the point i was trying to make is that contrary to rc mojumdar's thesis of india as a kind of inheritor of greece and rome fighting off british colonialism with its own version of a different kind of colony building in the far east this was not panikar's idea and this was exactly where the break today has come again so indeed the term soft power is a very good term 
except that it's it's kind of a little trite and fashionable now. However, having said that, two things have to be remembered. And now this is important. I think India's soft power, if I may say so, was horizontal in the sense that the links were not between the polities of Southeast Asia and Indian kingdoms in the way that the links were between those Southeast Asian polities and the Chinese hierarchic system, the, um, the Nanyan system, which was, if you like, vertical. So India exercised horizontal influence on Southeast Asia, China vertical. But having said that, I think the invasion of Kedah in 1025 made the point that um, uh, soft power can always and sometimes has to be accompanied by hard power. And very quickly, I was in New Delhi for a conference and there was a gentleman from the from the Navy and there was we were having a discussion on soft power and he said, you can see my uniform. Your office, no, I don't believe in soft power. We are here because of hard power. But that's one thing. So that is about soft power. Uh, quickly again, why Curzon? I mentioned Curzon. I, I think the Commodore mentioned him in a, in a slightly different context. My point, looking at um, Panikar's works from Southeast Asia, was to see how India has been uh, imagined, if you like, as a, commun- as, a, as, a, as, a, as a country by people who, of course, Curzon was not Indian, but he, you know, he, he, he was there on behalf of the British. Curzon's idea of India as a key player in the world was a part of British thinking. It was the British Raj. But having taken off from that and actually having gone beyond that, linking up with the Cholas, coming down to Curzon, looking ahead at India, I think Panika managed to refine some of these ideas with an eye to how independent, independent India should behave. So independent India is not that old Hindu India or the Cholas, if that term can be used. It's not the British, it's not British India, it's independent India. So Curzon, for all the things that he did to Bengal, which was my province, is in a sense my, the province of my heart. Uh, essentially, when it came to thinking as an Indian, he was, I suppose, one could say a brilliant Indian like Panikar was. That's why Curzon came in. Uh, was pragmat- Panikar a pragmatist or uh, did he have fixed ideas? I think the Commodore gave a very good answer to that. I think with, uh, and as you said yourself, Chair, the, right at the start, that there's a way of seeing Panikar as, an histo- as a historian and there's a way of seeing Panikar as a strategist. Many of his historic historical theories have are outdated, it's true. There are new paradigms that are coming to fore, new ways of seeing the world. But if we go to, and this is the point that the, the, this conference is about Panikar. So if we start with what Panikar made of his times against the backdrop of his past times, their past times, we have an idea then of how we can bring those together and see what Panikar made of India in that world of his and the world in, in, in that India. And this is where he might well be called, I don't know, uh, he was a, pra- so in other words, he was, he did have rather fixed ideas as a historian. And you have pointed out that some of those ideas are outmoded, which they are. But because those ideas were not outmoded at the time at which he thought them, his work as a strategist is still important because there was a point in the morning session where a gentleman put it very beautifully. Uh, we don't live in past times, but we wouldn't think of those past times unless we had something in common with those times. History is the present's engagement with the past. It is not the past. It's not the present. Very quickly, and uh, that I think that takes the three points. Nationalism. Very good point, Chair. Uh, the uh, thing is that, um, again, very interesting. If you think of pre-colonial India, what term would you use? What ideological term would you use for it? I don't know what that term would be. If you think of colonial India, then that the term is colonialism. It's imperialism. Therefore, nationalism, of course, impedes the view because it tries to create new circumstances from old origins. And in the process, it gets bogged down in the in, 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 in the movements, in the processes of the present. Having said that, I think it's important. I think for me, Panika is important precisely because he is a nationalist, but an internationalist nationalist. I know this sounds, it's, a, it's contrarian, but he was very international in, in, in thinking about India, but he thought about that India as an Indian, not as somebody else thinking about India. And therefore, I think this combination of a very acute nationalism with very, very clear, unyielding internationalism is what makes Panika important to me. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Before giving the word 
uh, to Ms. Um, Atira Anand, I, I would like to uh, put a question that is uh, on the chat box for uh, um, by the director of uh, the Marist uh, Maritime History Society. Um, is there any content by Sardar Panikar on medieval Malabar linkages to Arabia and China? What are his views in general on these connections? And uh, that said, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's true that along the during 15th century, during mid 15th century, along with Malabar, there was Gujarat, Bengal as uh, trade centers in India. And in uh, I was my paper was dealing with uh, Dutch and Malabar and Portuguese uh, and Malabar intervention. Um, Calicut the Ascendancy of Calicut in Malabar was a factor, and uh, which is an important trading uh, petty kingdom in Malabar. Um, and uh, Calicut have trade connections with the Bengal, Gujarat, and commodities. There were studies which says that uh, commodities were fl flowing to uh, even to Calicut, and there were trade interconnections within uh, this Indian subcontinent at that particular period of time. And of course, uh, Panikkar also identified the importance of Goa uh, in his uh, book when he mentions about uh, L. Caesar Frederick, who visited India between 1568 and 1589, describing Cochin, the chiefest place next unto Goa. Also, uh, there was a religious, commercial, and power goals uh, for this Portuguese interventions. There were communities of Christian trading centers in uh, Malabar region, which also attracted uh, the Portuguese interventions. And uh, basically because of this uh, political uh, struggle between Cochin and Calicut, which, uh, which made the Portuguese uh, uh, difficult for uh, trade, um, making trade uh, uh, in Malabar. If that not happened, they might have used Malabar and Goa as both as a region of uh, their uh, trade manipulations. And regarding uh, medieval Malabar and China, uh, he has not written much on these relations. Uh, uh, mainly uh, his uh, studies that I referred uh, were relating to mid 15th century. By that time, uh, a diplomatic exchange between China and the Malabar region was cut off. Thank you. Well, uh, the floor is open uh, to more questions. Uh, does anyone want to um, ask anything else? Mm. No. Uh, Pragya, I don't know if we close the session. Yeah, we may uh, we can close the session if we do. Close the session? Yeah. Okay. Then, um, once again, uh, it has been my privilege and honor uh, to preside over this session with three interesting papers uh, delivered by uh, three uh, uh, researchers who know uh, their work, and um, I end this session thanking again the organizer, the organizers, for um, recuperating the the work uh, of uh, Panikal, who is still so interesting and vital today as, as it was when he wrote it in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. And again, finishing, uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, presenting the papers and for attending this session. 
Thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Chair, for your very interesting comments as well as for conducting the session. Thank you to all our three uh, presenters for very you know, insightful presentations and, and a very fruitful discussion. So with this, we come to an end of uh, the day one of the conference and we reconvene tomorrow, 10 a.m. sharp Indian Standard Time for the second day of the conference with session three. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for coming.